Please subscribe, like, and share. It really helps us out. And of course, if you have any questions, comment below and we will answer you as soon as we can. Welcome to another video in our series on IGCSE Geography. In today's lesson, we will be looking at coastal environments. If you haven't seen our previous videos, click on the card above. Firstly, for coastal environments we will be looking at destructive and constructive waves. The power of waves is one of the most significant forces of coastal change. Waves are created by wind blowing over the surface of the sea. As the wind blows over the sea, friction is created, producing a swell in the water. The energy of the wind causes water particles to rotate inside the swell and this moves the wave forward. The size and energy of a wave is influenced by 1. How long the wind has been blowing 2. The strength of the wind 3. How far the wave has traveled, or the fetch Waves can be destructive or constructive. When a wave breaks, water is washed up the beach, this is called the swash. Then the water runs back down the beach, this is called the backwash. With a constructive wave, the swash is stronger than the backwash. With a destructive wave, the backwash is stronger than the swash. Firstly, let's look at destructive waves. Destructive waves are created in storm conditions. They are created from big, strong waves when the wind is powerful and has been blowing for a long time. They occur when wave energy is high and the wave has traveled over a long fetch. They tend to erode the coast. They have a stronger backwash than swash. They have a short wavelength and are high and steep. Secondly, constructive waves. They are created in calm weather and are less powerful than destructive waves. They break on the shore and deposit material, building up beaches. They have a swash that is stronger than the backwash. They have a long wavelength and are low in height. Now, let's look at coastal erosion. The sea shapes the coastal landscape. Coastal erosion is the wearing away and breaking up of rock along the coast. Destructive waves erode the coastline in a number of ways. Firstly, hydraulic action. Air may become trapped in joints and cracks on a cliff face. When a wave breaks, the trapped air is compressed which weakens the cliff and causes erosion. Secondly, abrasion. Bits of rock and sand and waves grind down cliff surfaces like sandpaper. Thirdly, attrition. Waves smash rocks and pebbles on the shore into each other, and they break and become smoother. Fourthly, solution. Acids contained in seawater will dissolve some types of rocks such as chalk or limestone. Moving on, coastal transportation. The various types of material found in the sea comes from many different sources. These sources include 1. Being eroded from cliffs. 2. Being transported by longshore drift along the coastline. 3. Being brought inland from offshore by constructive waves. 4. Being carried to the coastline by rivers. Waves can approach the coast at an angle because of the direction of the prevailing wind. The swash of the waves carries material up the beach at an angle. The backwash then flows back to the sea in a straight line at 90 degrees. This movement of material is called transportation. Continual swash and backwash transports material sideways along the coast. This movement of material is called longshore drift and occurs in a zigzag. There are four ways that waves and tidal currents transport sediment. These can then contribute to the movement of sediment by longshore drift. Let's go through these. 1. Solution. Minerals are dissolved in seawater and carried in solution. The load is not visible. Load can come from cliffs made from chalk or limestone, and calcium carbonate is carried along in solution. 2. Suspension. Small particles are carried in water, for example silts and clays, which can make the water look cloudy. Currents pick up large amounts of sediment in suspension during a storm, when strong winds generate high-energy waves. 3. Saltation. 
Load is bounced along the seabed, for example small pieces of shingle or large sand grains. Currents cannot keep the larger and heavier sediment afloat for long periods. 4. Traction. Pebbles and larger sediment are rolled along the seabed. Next, coastal deposition. When the sea loses energy, it drops the sand, rock particles and pebbles it has been carrying. This is called deposition. Deposition happens when the swash is stronger than the backwash and is associated with constructive waves. Deposition is likely to occur when 1. Waves enter an area of shallow water. 2. Waves enter a sheltered area, for example, a cove or bay there is little wind. 3. There is a good supply of material. Next, let's look at coastal landforms. Coastal landforms can be either erosional or depositional. Sandy beaches, shingle beaches and spits are examples of depositional landforms. On the other hand cliffs, headlands and caves are examples of erosional landforms. Firstly, let's look at erosional landforms. One of the most common features of a coastline is a cliff. Cliffs are shaped through a combination of erosion and weathering, this being the breakdown of rocks caused by weather conditions. Soft rock, for example sand and clay, erodes easily to create gently sloping cliffs. Hard rock, for example chalk, is more resistant and erodes slowly to create steep cliffs. Let's look at the process of cliff erosion. The sea attacks the base of the cliff forming a wave cut notch. The notch increases in size. Weather weakens the cliff which causes it to collapse. The backwash carries the rubble towards the sea forming a wave cut platform. A wave cut platform is the bedrock that is left behind as the cliff moves backwards. The process repeats and the cliff continues to retreat. Now, let's look at headlands and bays. Headlands are formed when the sea attacks a section of coast with alternating bands of hard and soft rock. The bands of soft rock, such as sand and clay, erode more quickly than those of more resistant rock, such as chalk. This leaves a section of land jutting out into the sea called a headland. The areas where the soft rock has eroded away, next to the headland, are called bays. Next, caves, arches, stacks and stumps. Erosion can create caves, arches, stacks and stumps along a headland. Firstly, cracks in the rock erode through abrasion. Secondly, caves occur when waves force their way into cracks in the cliff face. The water contains sand and other materials that grind away at the rock until the cracks become a cave. Hydraulic action and abrasion are the predominant erosion processes. Thirdly, if the cave is formed in a headland, it may eventually break through to the other side forming an arch. Fourthly, the arch will continue to be eroded through attrition and will gradually become bigger until it can no longer support the top of the arch. When the arch collapses, it leaves the headland on one side and a stack, a tall column of rock, on the other. Fifthly, the stack will be attacked at the base in the same way that a wave cut notch is formed. This weakens the structure and it will eventually collapse to form a stump. Moving on, depositional landforms. Firstly, beaches. Beaches are a common feature of a coastline. Beaches are made up of eroded material that has been transported from elsewhere and deposited by the sea. Constructive waves help to build up beaches. The material found on a beach, things like sand or shingle, depends on the geology of the area and wave energy. A cross-section of a beach is called a beach profile. The material found on a beach varies in size and type as you move further away from the shoreline. The smallest material is deposited near the water and larger material is found nearer to the cliffs at the back of the beach. Large material is deposited at the back of the beach in times of high energy, for example during a storm. Most waves break near the shoreline, so sediment near the water is more effectively broken down by attrition. First, Shingle Beaches this is a beach where strong swash waves will be assisted by windy and stormy conditions to throw larger pieces of shingle further up the beach. Shingle beaches will usually contain many different ridges across their profile. The smallest material will be found on the beach face and larger pieces of shingle or pebble will be thrown to the back of the beach. Shingle beaches usually have much steeper profiles. 
Second, sandy beaches. This is a beach where strong swash waves move sandy material up the beach with a spilling wave. Backwash will be weaker. The coarsest or biggest pieces of sand will be found at the wave limit, further up the beach. Sandy beaches usually have a gently sloping profile. The next topic is spits. Spits are also created by deposition. A spit is an extended stretch of beach material that projects out to sea and is joined to the mainland at one end. Spits are formed where the prevailing wind blows at an angle to the coastline, resulting in longshore drift. An example of a spit is Spurn Head, found along the Holderness Coast in Humberside. The development of Spurn Head was as follows. 1. Longshore drift moves material along the coastline, erosion is taking place further back along the coastline. The prevailing winds help to transport material along the coast. 2. Deposited material starts to build up where the coastline changes direction. 3. A spit starts to form when the material is deposited. 4. Over time, the spit grows and develops a hook if wind direction changes further out. 5. Waves cannot get past a spit, which creates a sheltered area where silt is deposited in mudflats or salt marshes form. Lastly for today, coastal management. Coastal areas are used for tourism, fishing, industry, trade and transport. Various coastal management strategies are employed each coming with a number of advantages and disadvantages. So, what are the reasons for coastal defense? Firstly, people live near the coast. In most continents around the world, except Africa, people are concentrated along the coastline. People like the view and as a result house prices along the coast are often very high. These expensive houses need protection. Secondly, Coastal areas are important economically. Many coastal areas rely on ports for effective transport links. Railway lines are often built along the flat land at the coastline. Industry is also often based in coastal areas. In recent years, the tourism industry in Northern Ireland has grown. Hotels, guest houses and caravan parks are found in coastal areas near key attractions such as Titanic Quarter and the Giant's Causeway. Thirdly, Sea levels rise as a result of climate change. The greenhouse effect has caused global temperatures to rise. Global warming over recent years is causing the global climate to change. One direct effect is an increase in the rise of sea levels. In the UK sea levels around the UK have risen by 10 centimeters. If the sea levels continue to rise, many low-lying areas such as the Netherlands and Bangladesh are going to suffer severe consequences. What are the methods of coastal management? 1. Hard and soft engineering methods can be used to manage the erosion and flooding at the coast. 2. Hard engineering methods involve building structures to stop erosion and flooding to protect the coast. 3. Soft engineering methods are usually more ecologically sensitive. They will attempt to manage erosion and floods. We will start by looking at hard engineering methods. Hard engineering options tend to be expensive, short-term options. They may also have a high impact on the landscape or environment and be unsustainable. Firstly, sea walls. A solid wall that is used to separate the land from the sea. The advantage is it protects the base of cliffs, land and buildings against erosion. They can also prevent coastal flooding in some areas. The disadvantages are, they are expensive to build and maintain. Also, curved sea walls reflect the energy of the waves back to the sea. This means that the waves remain powerful. They can also be unattractive. Next, groins. A groin is a wooden barrier built at right angles to the beach. The advantages include that they prevent longshore drift moving beach material along the coast. They also allow the buildup of a beach. Beaches are a natural defense against erosion and an attraction for tourists. The disadvantages are they can be unattractive and costly to build and maintain. Finally, gabions. Gabions are large boulders piled up on the beach in steel cages. The advantages are they absorb the energy of waves. They also allow the buildup of a beach. The disadvantages are, they can be expensive to obtain and transport the boulders. They can also look unattractive. 
Next, let's look at soft engineering methods. Soft engineering options are often less expensive than hard engineering options. They are usually more long-term and sustainable, with less impact on the environment. There are two main types of soft engineering. Firstly, beach nourishment. This replaces beach or cliff material that has been removed by erosion or longshore drift. The main advantage is that beaches are a natural defense against erosion and coastal flooding. Beaches also attract tourists. It is a relatively inexpensive option but requires constant maintenance to replace the beach material as it is washed away. Secondly, managed retreat. Areas of the coast are allowed to erode and flood naturally. Usually this will be areas considered to be of low value, for example, places not being used for housing or farmland. The advantages are that it encourages the development of beaches, a natural defense, and salt marshes, important for the environment, and cost is low. Managed retreat is a cheap option, but people will need to be compensated for loss of buildings and farmland. Thank you for watching our video. Please like, subscribe and share. And comment below so we can clarify things for you.